Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Lyndon Walker and I'm going to be talking you through this video where we look at research design. So the first thing that we're going to look at is what we call independent variables and dependent variables. When we have a hypothesis, we will normally be looking at some sort of relationship between variables and we want to have a way of being able to classify these. So we have what we call independent and dependent. I've got two examples here and with each one you can see that I have one variable and then I have an arrow pointing towards another variable. So with our first one we're looking at driving ability and we're interested to see in our experiment that we're going to do where the driving ability varies with blood alcohol level. So we can see that there's a very clear direction. Your driving ability isn't going to have any impact on your blood alcohol level, but there's a good chance that your blood alcohol level is going to have an impact on your driving ability. So in this case, our independent variable is our blood alcohol level, and our dependent variable is driving ability, because we're saying that the driving ability depends on the blood alcohol level. So in our second example, we can see that uh, we're interested in the relationship between the logical reasoning test results and whether the person performed the test under quiet or noisy conditions. And again, it's quite clear that there's a, a direction to this. Uh, if someone's dealing with noisy conditions, perhaps they're going to do worse in the test than if it's quiet. So we would be saying that our test results depend on the conditions that you set the test in. So when we're looking to work out what is our independent variable or our IV and what's our dependent variable or our DV, uh, we want to look at uh, how the question has been written or how the scenario has been written and try and look which direction uh, that dependency is occurring. So which one of these variables depends on the other one? A lot of the time we can just use logic because there'll only be one clear direction like with our blood alcohol level. Sometimes it can be a little bit trickier. So you can see I've got two examples here. One one where we might say that the amount of time you spend on an activity depends on how uh, good you are, how good your skill level is. But on the other hand, we might say your skill level depends on how long you spend doing it. So in the first case, where we're saying that time depends on skill, we're saying that time is the dependent variable. In the second dot point, we're saying that the skill level depends on how much time you're spending, so skill level is the dependent variable. So every so often we might have one where it's a little bit trickier because it's perfectly reasonable for one variable to depend on the other or vice versa. And in that case, we really need to read the sentence carefully to see what the scenario is saying. Which way around is the scenario saying that that dependent relationship is going to be? Okay, so just pause the video now and have a look at this example. I want you to identify the independent and the dependent variables for each of these three examples. Okay, so hopefully you've had a go of each of these three examples. So for our first one, younger people are more likely to own a mobile phone than older people. So the first thing we need to make sure we do is that we're correctly identifying what is a variable. So in this case, if we're talking about younger people and old people, then the variable that is being measured is age. So we need to make sure that we don't talk about young and old when we're identifying the variable. The variable, the thing that we're measuring, is the age of the people. And the other variable is whether or not they own a mobile phone. So if we think about which way around, which one of those might depend on the other one, I'm pretty sure that going out and buying a mobile phone isn't going to make me younger, so I'm pretty sure that my age isn't going to depend on my mobile phone ownership, but certainly the other way around, mobile phone ownership would be our dependent variable because it might depend on the age of the person. For our second one, do women tend to do more housework than men? So one of our variables is gender, and the other variable is how much time uh, someone is spending doing housework. And again, quite a clear direction for the arrow. Doing housework is not going to change your gender, so we can't say that gender depends on housework, but we certainly can uh, reverse that, have it the other way around. So the amount of time spent doing housework is going to be our dependent variable, and we're saying that may depend on gender. For our last one, blood cholesterol level related to the amount of exercise that they do. So 
we're not assuming that we have any particular medical knowledge, uh, but we would assume that the amount of exercise is going to be the independent variable, and the dependent variable, the outcome, is the blood cholesterol level. Two more terms that we need to know about are what we call experimental studies and observational studies. So when someone is setting up a study, there's normally one of two ways uh, that they are going to run it. So an experimental study is where the researcher is able to manipulate the independent variable. So we're actually having, as the researcher, we're having some influence on what's happening with our independent variable, and then we watch what happens with the dependent variable. The nice thing with an experiment is that we can use it to draw causal conclu conclusions. Uh, unfortunately, it can be a little bit difficult in some scenarios to set up an experiment. Sometimes there might be ethical issues with having an experiment. For instance, any kind of research around smoking. We can't manipulate the independent variable of whether someone smokes or not. We can't say, okay, these people have to smoke and these people have to not smoke. The only way that we could do medical research uh, looking at effects of smoking is with an observational study where we don't have any control on who smokes and who doesn't smoke, all we can do is watch what happens. So an observational study, we're just watching both the independent variable and dependent variable. Unfortunately with these we're not able to make causal conclusions, uh, but sometimes it can be useful even if we could do an experiment to look at observational data first and it might help us to identify some variables of interest. So let's have a look at this example. So we're interested in the number of patient deaths that are recorded at a large hospital, large teaching hospital and a local private hospital to see if there's a difference in the death rate between the two. So firstly, what is the independent variable and the dependent variable? So the two things that are getting looked at here, the first is the type of hospital. We've got two different types of hospital. And the second, it says death rate. In order to work out the rate of something, we need to work out how many there are. So even though it says death rate, we're going to be interested in the number of deaths. So our independent variable is going to be the type of hospital, and the dependent variable is going to be the number of deaths in each hospital. So is this experiment experimental or observational? We did not manipulate the independent variable. The teaching hospital is a teaching hospital, we didn't make it a teaching hospital, the other one's a private hospital, uh, we are just observing what happens in them. So we did not manipulate the independent variable, which means this is an observational study. A nuisance variable is a variable that is not the independent variable, but some other variable that is related to the dependent variable. And we'll have a look in a second and it, we'll see why exactly they're called nuisance variables but basically a nuisance variable is something else which is related to a dependent variable, a variable of interest other than the one where we're really trying to find out about the relationship. Two things uh, for us to remember, one is that the independent variable itself is never a nuisance variable because it's the one that we're interested in. Uh, the other one that we should always check for when we're trying to decide whether something is a nuisance variable is whether or not it varies. In order to be a nuisance variable, it actually has to be something which has multiple categories or different possible values. So it's actually got to be a variable. So if we come back to our blood alcohol and driving ability example, there's all sorts of other things that might have an impact on driving ability above and beyond blood alcohol level. And if we just ignored all of those things, we may go and do an experiment and we may say there's a particular relationship between blood alcohol level and driving ability, but in fact there were these other factors like the driver's reflexes, the type of car, the weather, uh, the driver's experience, that were all also having an impact on the driving ability of the individuals. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to use research design in order to try and solve this issue of these different nuisance variables. So our nuisance variables might be uh, subject related or they might be situational. So a subject nuisance variable is one that is associated with a participant. So for our driving uh, experiment, things like age and gender and driving experience might have some kind of impact on the person's driving ability. The situational nuisance variables are the ones that are related to the conditions of the experiment. 
So these could be things like the type of car, uh, the time of the day, the driving course, the weather. And so what we want to do is we want to look at how we can overcome this problem of having these other things that are impacting on uh, our measurement of driving ability and the relationship it has with blood alcohol level. So one of the ways that we go about this is with different kinds of research design. So we've got three main sets of design that we learn about in this unit. First one is called repeated measures. So with repeated measures we have the same participants for both conditions. So for our blood alcohol we would have the same participants doing the driving course when they are sober and then after they've had some alcohol. So this can be good for some kinds of experiments, but for this particular one this could cause a little bit of a problem because maybe the second time through the driving test people are just better because they've had some practice. They've already learnt some things from the first time they did it. So we need to be careful if we're using repeated measures, so all of the same people doing both levels of our independent variable because there may be practice effects. The second kind of design is what's called matched pairs. So this is where we try and split up our participants uh, into two groups, but we try and make each individual in each group have someone that matches very similarly to someone else in the other group on our nuisance variables. So if we had, uh, if we were trying to divide with some of those variables like age and gender, then we would try and have each person of a particular age and gender in one of our groups, say our uh, no alcohol group, matched with someone of the same or very similar age and same gender in the driving with alcohol group. So we'd pair the people, pair, pair them up and then randomly allocate uh, one group to be the alcohol and one to be the non-alcohol. Uh, and this would get around that problem of practice effects because this time the people are only doing the driving test once, they're not doing it under both conditions. One difficulty though is we probably aren't going to be able to identify all of the nuisance variables. So we might have matched them up in age and gender, but maybe there's some other trait that we haven't thought of and we've gone and put all of one type of person in one group and the other type of person in the other group. Our final design method is called independent groups designed, and this is where we just randomly allocate the people to groups. So if we were going to have an independent groups design, we'd randomly say that half the people are going to do the driving test uh, with alcohol and half the people are going to do it without alcohol. And this is a little bit easier for us to do, we don't need to worry about matching, um, but we may just randomly end up with two funny groups. Most of the time the independent groups design is going to do a pretty good job for us. Some of the other things we could do in order to deal with our nuisance variables. Uh, for the situational ones, if we can, we would try and hide them constant. So if we think that the make of car or the time of day or the driving course has an impact on driving ability, well, let's just hold it constant. Let's make sure that all the people have do the driving test at the same time of the day. Let's make sure they use the same car. Let's make sure they use the same driving course. And by doing that, then it's not a nuisance variable anymore because it's not a variable. It's not something that's changing between our measurements. Another thing that we might do is we might do what's called counterbalancing. So with counterbalancing, we split up our group and we test half of them under one condition. Uh, and then we test half of them under the other condition. So we're basically balancing things out. So uh, maybe we were going to have a repeated measures design. So remember when we looked at repeated measures we were a bit worried that there might be a practice effect. But what we could do is have half the people do the test sober first and then with alcohol and the other half we could do with alcohol and then sober. Obviously we need to have a little bit of a time there for them to sober up. but we would then get around that problem of that practice effect. So basically one of the big ways of dealing with any kind of nuisance variables and problems we have with our experimental design is randomization. And we've looked at a couple of different methods, um, there's whole units you can study on experimental design, it's quite a complex area. Um, so if you are interested you can go and read more about other kinds of designs that you might do. Uh, when you're trying to collect data in an unbiased way. 
So one last thing for us to consider when we're looking at an experimental design is what's called confounding. So a confounding factor is even more of a problem than a nuisance variable because a confounding factor is correlated or related to both the independent variable and the dependent variable. And this is a big problem because it can mask what effect the independent variable is having on the dependent variable. So for example, let's imagine that I wanted to see if some new teaching exercises were going to improve the marks of the students, and I gave lecturer A the new exercises, but lecturer B used the old exercises, and I found that lecturer A's students performed better. So Here's the problem, I don't know whether it was the exercises or it was the lecturer who meant that one group did better than the other. So in this case lecturer, our variable lecturer A and B, is confounded with exercises, old and new. Uh, we know that both of these things are related to one another because A used the new and B used the old. And we know that both of them are related to the marks because a students had higher marks than B, but also new exercises had higher marks than the old ones. So these two variables are confounded with each other. We don't know which one is the um, had the effect. Maybe both of them had the effect. But the way that this experiment has been set up, we've got this problem of confounding. What we would need to do is we would need to uh, either use the same lecturer with new exercises and old exercises, maybe with two different classes or two different semesters, or maybe we need some kind of other randomization in order to not have this uh, problem where one variable is confounded with the other. This has been a Swinburne production.